Hello and a very warm welcome to a brand new edition of To The Point with me, Frank Pereira on Rajya Sabha Television. Another blatant attack this time around in Uri where 17 um, army personnel were killed by four terrorists and this time too, the terrorists had all the markings of uh, coming in from Pakistan. To talk about how India should deal with Pakistan after this fresh round of attack in Uri and what India's foreign policy towards Pakistan should be, I have the former Foreign Secretary here with me on the program, Ambassador Kawal Sibal. Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to Rajya Sabha. My Shabbat. pleasure. So, you know, in the context of what happened just a couple of days ago in Uri, what should India's foreign policy towards Pakistan be? Should we change how we deal with Pakistan? Well, you know, this is a question we've been asking ourselves after every terrorist strike. And Pakistan has been engaged in terrorism against us since the middle 1980s. Uh, each time there is a major terrorist attack, even after Mumbai, we've been uh, trying to find out what would be an adequate response. And at the end of the day, uh, at least the previous government and even the actual government in its initial phases felt that dialogue was the only route that somehow Pakistan would, would understand that it is, it is in its own interest to give up this instrument of terror, especially because inside Pakistan, these extremist organizations and terrorist organizations are wreaking havoc and they are fighting the Pakistani state. So judging by how we as a responsible country and government would think about our national interests, we thought Pakistan would at some stage realize they must change their approach. It hasn't happened. And after Pathan Court, when we felt that Pakistan at least initially admitted that people had come from Pakistan and gave an impression that they were willing to cooperate and do something uh, to punish the perpetrators, mm -hmm. as a result of which we allowed them to come to Pathan Court. And at the end of the day, uh, they have just backtracked. So um, we've tried everything. Well, Pakistan has actually, actually tried everything and we have, rea in reaction, we have tried everything. Mm. There has been uh, military conflict. Uh, we have uh, tried to deal with the problem of terrorism. We have tried to deal with Pakistani efforts to internationalize uh, the issue. We not found the right mixture of policy to dissuade Pakistan for pursuing uh, this uh, terrorist activity against us. and and. Uh, this unhanding, visceral hostility uh, towards India, which is also animated by this uh, religious factor, which, which is very difficult uh, for, us to, for us to handle. Now, what could be uh, our policy now? Let me put it like this, mm. that there is no new solution that we can find. Because it's not as if people previously were not analyzing what would be the range of our responses. That said, Ambassador, is it time for military action? Well, you know, when they attacked us in Kargil, we, we responded with military action. Then there has been for months uh, violations of the ceasefire line by Pakistan, and we have responded very vigorously. And this government had actually given a, a mandate to the field commanders to respond as they wished. So that is military action. So. After all, uh, when the parliament was attacked, when we massed our forces, and then when terrorist attacks took place, and especially Mumbai, the possibility of a military response was considered, hmm. but was not undertaken. So it's not as if we have not analyzed all the pros and cons of military action. Is it because of the nuclear threat that Pakistan may possess? At the end of the day, I think there are two reasons. One is the problem of escalation, hmm. that if you actually uh, uh, ro responded robustly, not simply with the uh, firing across the line of control, but uh, surgical strikes, use of air force, commando operations. Uh, Pakistan is not going to take it lying down. Uh, it's quite clear. They are a half suicidal state in, in some ways because you can see how they're becoming a failing state and they don't want to change their thinking and approach. That they will react and then the spiral of escalation uh, could uh, lead to not a nuclear strike, but could lead to external intervention mm. uh, because the Security Council will definitely come into play, etc., etc., and we'll be equated with Pakistan. And it'll also hurt us, our international image and our efforts to concentrate on our economy 
and people will say again, even though the right may be on our side, that for heaven's sake, India is a big power, responsible power. Uh, why is it failing uh, to reach some kind of a modus vivendi, even <laughs> with a country like Pakistan? So the burden would partially fall on us also uh, to find a solution, and that's not a happy situation. Because unfortunately, there are two things. One is that America continues to back Pakistan, mm. despite the fact that uh, they have suffered casualties their own people, their soldiers killed at the hands of Pakistan indirectly uh, through the proxies, through this terrorism, through the Haqqani group. And these fellows, they actually gave shelter to Osama bin Laden and the Americans have forgiven. Not only forgiven, they apply them with rewards, military aid, economic aid, which continues. So now that they have $300 million they've held back, there's unnecessarily, you know, big sort of self-congratulation in the press that at last the Americans have mm. realized what Pakistan is. This is just tinkering with the situation. The manner in which they have sanctioned Russia, which is a strategically a superpower, yes. and the only country in the world which can destroy the United States, but Americans haven't, has hastened, haven't hesitated to impose sanctions on Russia. So why are they hesitating to impose sanctions on Pakistan. And then the new other factor is China. China, indeed. I mean, that's what I wanted to come and to. I mean, on China, one hand, you have the US, and then on the other hand, you have China, which is building the, you know, uh, the Silk Route, and it's building a highway or, or an express right through pa pa Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. So on the other hand, China is also a big factor. No, it's more than that. Now China is, uh, is, has replaced the United States as the principal backer, uh, all-round backer, of uh, Pakistan. The Pakistani public hates the Americans. They have no such feelings towards uh, China. China. And the rhetoric of a relationship higher than the mountain, deeper than the sea, God knows what kind of analogies uh, they give, uh, iron relationship, lips and teeth and nonsense like that. But far more seriously than the CPEC is the fact that they have given them nuclear and missile capability yes. and continue to assist their nuclear weapon program, while at the same time blocking us uh, in the NSG. Uh, and they have become their biggest defense partner. And now with this economic project, which is a strategic project, which goes far beyond simply their bilateral relationship because it fits into China's larger geopolitical design. The relationship between China and Pakistan has got, at least on paper and in terms of uh, ambitions, much more uh, robust now. Uh, and they will support Pakistan to the hilt. Uh, and, and it's a permanent member of the Security Council. Yes. So, so you can't do anything in the Security Council either, even if you've got the others on your side. So, and that brings me to the other point, which is relevant, because I've heard all this debate that uh, try to isolate Pakistan. Pakistan cannot be isolated. Mm. So long and why as, do you say that? So long as two permanent members of the Security Council are backing them, how can you isolate them? And now Russia is... Uh, beginning to have a small defense relationship. They have announced joint military exercise. So even Russia doesn't want to isolate Pakistan. In our joint statements with Russia, although they are robust paras on terrorism, Pakistan is never named. Uh, so how do you isolate? And then there, are, there is the Muslim country, the Arab country, Saudi Arabia, which have certain kind of linkages with Pakistan. And they'll continue to support Pakistan, especially there's a nuclear relationship of sorts between uh, Pakistan and uh, Saudi, Saudi, Arabia. Saudi Arabia. Turkey is a big supporter uh, of, uh, of Pakistan. Uh, so I don't think Pakistan can be isolated. So what is the solution then? How do we, how, what does India look forward to and how does India tackle this problem? Look, there are some problems which uh, cannot always be tackled the way you want and to which there are no easy solutions. Now, if, after all, nobody has discovered a cure for cancer and you can't deal with cancer. So if you look upon Pakistan as a form of cancer, then uh, you should realize the limitations in dealing with it. Uh, it is a unique country. Uh, actually, it is much more of a rogue state than even uh, North Korea. Um, so, and then it is armed with nuclear weapons. It's a large country, 180, 200 million uh, people with a strong army and with, as I mentioned, backing by some of the world's key. In fact, it's very peculiar that it has the backing of the biggest, well, biggest, means strongest democracy in the world hmm. and the strongest authoritarian state in the world. I mean, <laughs> why should the Pakistan army or the Pakistani political class think 
that uh, they are on a sliding uh, road or that they are failing in the diplomacy, they can sit back and say that uh, despite all that we do, uh, we get the kind of minimum support we require from the international community in our challenge to India and we'll continue. So there's no easy solution, but something has to be done. Hmm. And, and what is this something, Ambassador? According to you, at least, what do you think needs to be done? Is diplomatic pressure the way forward? No, is that what we should do? Not at all. Okay. It won't work. As I said, for the reasons I mentioned, uh, after all, diplomatic pressure means uh, pressure through the principal powers of the world. Yes. It doesn't mean pressure through Southeast Asia or Africa or Latin America. So if the Americans and the Chinese and now even the Russians are wobbly uh, and the Europeans will follow the, British especially will follow the American need and they have strong links with Pakistan, although they have good relations with us, you cannot uh, deal with them diplomatically. And if if the United States is willing to absorb punishment, an actual killing of their personnel uh, by Pakistan and uh, do not uh, find it easy to diplomatically put pressure on Pakistan by imposing sanctions or this or that, the way they've done on Iran, there are limits to that. India doesn't have the capacity. However, uh, I would say that uh, one is that we should uh, take immediate military action. And mm. I say this because even in the past, I have in my own writings and views said that when a provocation like this occurs, the reaction should be instantaneous. Now, I can understand if this was the first time this happened and we have then to grope for a response. We have to have all our agencies sit together and say what we do. But since this has been done repeatedly, I'm convinced that we have studied this, analyzed this, and have come to a set of conclusions that this can be done. So you have a ready-made answer in terms of the uh, content of your response. So we should act immediately because if you don't, and some people are arguing that it should be at the time of our choosing this and that, what then happens is that uh, international diplomacy comes into play. The American Obama will bring up Prime Minister Modi, mm. um, the the. Uh, British will ring, ring up, somebody else uh, will ring up and counsel moderation and patience and say, you are a big country, you are a responsible country, Pakistan is irresponsible, it's a problem for all of us, we have to deal with it collectively, there's no easy solution, therefore let's not escalate and worsen matters, then the momentum is lost. Uh, and then if you then act 10 days, 15 days, one month later, then it looks like you have this premeditated action that when things were calming down, when the rest were trying to find a solution, you have raised the ante. This goes against you. But if you react on this immediately after provocation, the world will understand that you have been provoked so severely that you had to respond. Now, therefore, I think uh, uh, destroying their pickets and bunkers, mm -hmm. not that they will not retaliate, but let them retaliate across the uh, line of control, especially uh, action in the Neelam Valley, where they are very vulnerable and where the Chinese are making a project, this Kishan Ganga. And I am very strongly of the opinion that we should stop that project, given the kind of policies that Pakistan is pursuing with regard to the Indus Waters Treaty and blocking all our projects in our part of Kashmir, which, is, which are legitimate and allowed under the Indus Waters Treaty. So action there. Action in Skardu, which is an area we have never touched before that. Some yes. kind of action action there. And in addition, and time has come for that, that we should go ahead with our projects, water projects in Jammu and Kashmir, and reject any form of uh, uh, arbitration and things like that. Uh, the, if Pakistan wants to have the meeting of the commissioners, we should just delay it. We should not publicly say that we want to abrogate the mm. treaty at this stage, but act in a manner as if we are no longer following uh, the provisions of the treaty. Send those signals. This is necessary. Now, with regard to additional steps, surgical strikes, commando operations, uh, that, uh, okay, emotionally one can say that this should be done, make them pay the cost of what they're doing. Um, but this I would leave to the better judgment of our armed forces and our political uh, leadership to see uh, what is possible feasible, what is the kind of reaction that we should expect, and what is the state of our preparedness, uh, and our conversations with uh, the rest of the world, with some leaders, and then take a, take a view on that. And finally, uh, it is difficult to expound on this in public, but since we have raised the Balochistan issue, so there is a certain logic to that.
No, interestingly, uh, interesting that you raised the Balochistan issue. You know, initially we saw that Prime Minister Narendra Modi tried to be very welcoming, tried to speak to Nawaz Sharif. He even went down, flew down to Islamabad and wished him and all of that happened. And then immediately after that, we saw Patan Court happening. And then we've seen India take a very strong stand towards Pakistan. That said, with Uri happening now, do you foresee some kind of a military strike on Pakistan? You know, the logic of what we are saying uh, points to a strike, otherwise it doesn't make sense. Why should our uh, GOC, uh, Commander-in-Chief in Kashmir, uh, say that, uh, no, DGMO, sorry, say that uh, uh, these uh, people are from, are from Jaish e Muhammad and they had what they were carrying had Pakistani markings, etc., etc. That I, he said he has spoken to the DGMO in Pakistan. So we have clearly announced to our public that these guys came from Pakistan. Prime Minister says that the people involved in this will not go unpunished. In other words, Prime Minister says the direction is punish. Hmm. The army DGMO says Pakistan is involved. Then Even the Home Minister has said it. Home Minister, yes, but Prime Minister saying it is more important. Now, if this is what has been said, there is a logic to this, then what's the point in naming Pakistan and say that you will punish when you don't do anything? Mm. So you have to do it. Otherwise, don't say it. And therefore, I think, uh, and I personally think that there will be some action, but if it didn't occur, I think it will expose us that we remain terribly confused and we don't know what to do. Indeed. You know, let's look at the other aspect of it and, uh, you know, the Afghanistan's president Ghani was here in uh, India just last week and then we've seen in the past as well Bangladesh not having any kind of a relationship with Pakistan during the Home Minister's meet, the South Home Minister's meet, Bangladesh skipped it, Afghanistan skipped it and, you know, India too has said that, uh, uh, you know, they do not want to deal with Pakistan. So when it comes to the SARC countries and countries in the subcontinent, Pakistan is being isolated. Yes and no. Uh, you're right in terms of uh, Afghanistan and Bangladesh. Uh, there is now very bad blood between Pakistan and these two countries. And therefore, to that extent, we have uh, supporters within the SAR grouping now uh, who uh, would uh, who recognize Pakistan as a big problem within SAR. But don't count on Sri Lanka or Nepal uh, to abandon uh, Pakistan or, or accept the idea of a Sark without, uh, without Pakistan. Uh, that is one. The, the other is that uh, we have already rightly, in the context of the G20, invited the BIMSTEC countries yes. as part of a regional outreach of the BRICS countries, not G20, BRICS countries to, uh, to uh, the neighborhood. That's a good step. And which means that we have, we have begun the process of isolating Pakistan. Then there is the BBIN, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal, sub-regional grouping within SARC. That's what we must concentrate on. Uh, and therefore, I think time has come uh, to start abandoning the idea of SARC. Uh, and, and involve Afghanistan, but not as part of SARC, but uh, as part of some other configuration we can see how they can be fitted into the equation. But uh, I don't think uh, we should uh, uh, continue to allow Pakistan uh, to prevent uh, the, the uh, growth of SARC into any meaningful regional organization and play this game unnecessarily. So let them, if they, have their, if they want their future with Saudi Arabia and uh, the Central Asian countries, and if you, they want to become another version of an Islamic state, it's their misfortune. Let them go in that direction. Do you see Iran, Afghanistan and India coming closer together now in the near future? And isolating Pakistan? Yes and no. Uh, I think there is a good uh, basis for Iran, Afghanistan and India coming together uh, with regard to not only managing the situation in Afghanistan, uh, but also collaborating in uh, in connectivity to Central Asia and to Southern Russia. So uh, there is a huge uh, uh, community of interest there. Uh, in addition to that, uh, of course, we have uh, uh, this energy uh, as a kind of a source of uh, uh, compatibility of our larger interests 
uh, in this grouping. Uh, but beyond that, I think uh, we would not like to see Afghanistan come under the yoke of uh, the Taliban or a division of Afghanistan where eastern and southern Afghanistan uh, comes under the grip of the Taliban because uh, that, that would be the first phase of a disintegration hmm. of Afghanistan or a rollback of all the gains that the Afghanist, Afghan people uh, have uh, made uh, after the elimination of the Taliban. So India and Iran have a joint uh, interest. However, Iran also has a problem because from our point of view, not a problem, they have a certain strategic interest because Pakistan is a direct neighbor. Uh, and all said and done, there are elements within Iran uh, which uh, give value to the Islamic connection between Iran and uh, Pakistan. No wonder uh, the Sartaj Aziz mentioned the Revolutionary Guards uh, as, a, uh, as uh, a kind of lever they would like to use within Iran uh, to prevent the expansion of the Chabahar strategic yes. uh, uh, project. Uh, so we have to be uh, careful because Iran would not, uh, after all, you know, their diplomats have been killed. Uh, there have been incidents on the Balochistan uh, border. Rouhani's uh, visit to uh, Pakistan a few months ago went very badly because he was lectured by General Rahil Sharif and the Iranians reacted very severely. But, uh, but I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that we can have this configuration which will be openly anti-Pakistan, but yes, indirectly, it can serve to weaken and isolate Pakistan in the region west to uh, Pakistan and to that extent uh, be uh, a kind of uh, buffer uh, between reasonable countries and this rogue state. Indeed. You know, and finally, uh, Ambassador, before we end, that one final question, of course, uh, you know, Pakistan has been time and again bringing up the Kashmir issue of late and it's uh, also said that it's going to bring it up in the UNGA. Do you think that Pakistan's stand on Kashmir now is diluted with what has happened in Nuri? Pakistan's stand in any case has been diluted over the years. Since 1957, uh, the UN has never addressed the Kashmir issue or uh, passed any resolution. The Americans are saying repeatedly that this should be solved bilaterally between India and Pakistan and there's a change in this position. Mm. Because when I was serving in Washington and years after that, they had this very unsatisfactory formulation that the issue should be settled between India and Pakistan, taking into account the wishes of the Kashmiri people. So that was a swap to Pakistan, that we're not bringing self-determination openly as that phrase, but when we say in accordance with the wishes of the Kashmiri people, we are also, in a sense, taking a bow in the direction of what you want. But now they're not saying that. But very importantly, even China doesn't say it. Even China says this should, it's an issue left over by history and should be solved by bilaterally between mm. India and Pakistan. The other permanent members are not interested in uh, backing Pakistan on this issue. Uh, even uh, Gulf states and Saudi Arabia, I'm not talking the OIC, but bilaterally Gulf states and Saudi Arabia are not uh, putting any pressure on us on the Islamic uh, platform. So, where, so I, I don't think we should at all actually be one bit worried about uh, what shenanigans Nawaz Sharif is up to. Nobody is interested in that. And people remind Pakistan that there is a similar agreement and you've committed yourself to settling this issue bilaterally with India and that's it. Yes, on the what is happening in Jammu and Kashmir, all these pellet guns use and all the photographs that come out and killing of civilians. Yes, this does... Uh, this does raise some issues, this and that and that, but, but let's be realistic. What have these Western countries, what has America done? How many thousands, of thousands and hundreds and thousands of people they have killed in Iraq and in Libya and now in Syria, all the collateral da damage that has uh, taken place or what the British and others have done in, 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 in Libya in the past. No, in the present. In the present, uh, yes. Uh, it's continuing. Yes. Uh, so at the end of the day, this is all posturing. It's all posturing. And look at what China is doing in Tibet and in Xinjiang. Mm. So it's all posturing and we should not get overexcited by this. This is part of the diplomatic game. We can continue to play it. Indeed. All right. We'll have to end it at that. Uh, uh, Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us on the program and putting things into perspective for us. That's all the time we have on this edition of To The Point. Thank you so much for watching. See you again next time.